The cult of Artemis had a powerful following here. During the Roman period, prominent generals and politicians would come to Ephesus to offer sacrifices to the statue of Artemis, also known as Diana. While many other gods were worshipped here at Ephesus, Artemis was by far the most prominent deity in the first century. The cult of Artemis in Ephesus goes back hundreds of years prior to the Greeks. Our first record of a temple to Artemis here is one that was destroyed by flood in the 7th century BC. Under orders from King Croesus of Lydia, it was rebuilt out of marble around 550 BC, but that version was destroyed by fire in 356 BC. Local myth says that Artemis was away helping Olympias give birth to Alexander the Great when the fire broke out. Allegedly, that's why Artemis was unable to protect her shrine from destruction. The temple to Artemis was rebuilt yet again, but this time on an even grander scale, taking 120 years to finish. Historians such as Pliny and Antipater even called it one of the seven wonders of the ancient world. But during the time of Paul, this temple to Artemis was one of the largest and most impressive structures in the entire Mediterranean region, about four times larger than the Parthenon in Athens. Here is an awesome recreation of the structure at a park in Istanbul, Turkey. According to Pliny, the Temple of Artemis was situated on a platform about 425 by 239 feet. The temple itself was 352 by 163 feet with 127 columns that were 60 feet tall and over six feet thick. 36 of these columns were sculptured and overlaid with gold. The temple was built northeast of the city on marshy soil to protect the structure from earthquakes. At one time, the waves of the Mediterranean could actually come right up to one side of the temple. The cult of Artemis dominated here in Ephesus until the influence of Christianity eclipsed it over the next 200 years after Paul. Paul, who brought the message of the gospel here so long ago that disrupted the local trade in small Artemis statues. The Goths, a tribe from present-day Germany, destroyed this temple in 262 AD, and the ruins of it were reused in other building projects. And now, all that remains are these foundations and column fragments of what was once considered a true wonder of the ancient world. This point, so good to have you here with us this morning. Thanks for joining us, those of you who are here. And uh, those of you who have joined us online, thank you for doing so. We trust the Lord will bless you and encourage you. The media piece that uh, we just watched together is from the series Drive Through History, hosted by uh, Dave Stotts, filmed at the uh, biblical city of Ephesus, located on the western coast of modern-day Turkey. Stotts talks about why the Temple of Artemis, once so great a part of that city, is considered one of the seven wonders of the ancient world. I invite you, if you have a Bible with you this morning, to take it and turn to Acts chapter 19. And if you're watching us online, I hope that you'll do the same, turning your Bibles to Acts chapter 19. This morning, as we continue our current study series on the book of Acts, we're going to give some thought to how those in Christ back in the world of the first century challenged the cultural, uh, the, the cultural idolatry of their age and how idolatry still represents a very real challenge for those of us in Christ today, which may be somewhat of a surprise to you, but hopefully by the time we conclude our study this morning, that statement will make more sense. Beginning in Acts chapter 19, verse 20, we're told the word of the Lord spread widely and grew in power. After this, after all this had happened, Paul decided to go to Jerusalem, passing through Macedonia and Achaia. After I have been there, he said, I must visit Rome also. He sent two of his helpers, Timothy and Erastus, to Macedonia, while he stayed in the province of Asia a little longer. 
seeing the great work that the Lord was doing in the, uh, the city of Ephesus, Paul decides to look ahead to what his next stop would be, where he would next go in his missionary venture. And he decides to head back to Jerusalem. And on the way, he, as was in keeping with his practice, decided to revisit the region of Macedonia, specifically the Church of Philippi located in that region, as well as the region of Achaia, where the Church of Corinth is located. And to that end, he sends, as it were, an advance team to kind of go before him to those locations to kind of get things ready for his arrival. He sends two ministry associates, Timothy and Erastus, and uh, he begins by sending them to Macedonia to make preparations for his eventual arrival there. Beginning in verse 23 of our text, Acts 19, we read as follows, About that time there arose a great disturbance about the way. A silversmith named Demetrius, who made silver shrines of Artemis, brought in a lot of business for the craftsmen there. He called them together, along with the workers in related trades, and he said, You know, my friends, that we receive a good income from this business, and you see and hear how this fellow Paul has convinced and led astray large numbers of people here in Ephesus and in practically the whole province of Asia. He says that gods made by human hands are no gods at all. When my uh, first daughter, Faith, uh, was uh, a youngster, um, I used to tell her that when she turned 16, I would buy her a Ferrari. Now, I'm a car guy, and I love cars, and uh, um, I think the Lord has uh, purposely made sure that I don't have a sort of expendable income to buy cars, or I would have a collection of cars, and they would be expensive, exotic cars. When I have time to read what I want to read, it's car magazines. Uh, that's the nature of the shallowness of your pastor. Um, and so when my daughter was growing up, I would tell her, you know, Faith, when you get to be 16, I'm going to buy you a Ferrari. And, uh, of course, you know, when your child is 7 and 9 and 11, they, they trust you. You're their parent. You're their dad. Dad's not going to let me down. Dad's going to buy me a Ferrari. Um, and so I would talk about this from time to time. And as Faith got a little bit older, you know, she was doubting a bit about whether I would buy her a Ferrari. Um, but I kept saying that I would. And when she turned 16, in fact, I did buy her a Ferrari. And in fact, I have it here with me this morning. Here it is. It's an Enzo Ferrari, which is a Ferrari you definitely want in your collection uh, if you know about Ferraris. Uh, and of course, it's red. Of course, it's red. And uh, among the gifts that I gave her that day, I gave her a box in which was this Ferrari. And of course, when she opened it, she said something like, well, of course, that's a dad joke, right? I mean, that's what dads do, right? But I had strung this joke out for years that I was going to buy my daughter this Ferrari. That Ferrari that I just showed you is a 1 18th inch scale model of an actual car. And by the way, if you happen to have an Enzo Ferrari, talk to me after. Um, I would love to drive one. Um, but that's a, a scale replica of the car. And what I didn't show you, I should have the doors open and the hood and the trunk open. Uh, and so I thought it was pretty cool. My daughter, she thought it was pretty cool for about a month, and then she gave it back to me and said, Dad, I think you probably would enjoy this more than I do. And here it is all these years later. I still have it. It sits in my office here at the church. This guy that we meet in the text named Demetrius was a silversmith there in Ephesus, and he made silver shrines of the goddess Artemis. He made replicas from silver 
of the temple there in Ephesus. And at the center of those little replicas would be the statue of Artemis sitting at the center of her great temple. This is what Demetrius did. And he had a very successful business, he and his colleagues there in Ephesus. Uh, people would purchase these replica silver statues, as it were. And having purchased them, they would go to the temple of Artemis and they would offer them as an offering to the great goddess herself. Demetrius calls together a meeting of the local silversmiths' guild to discuss a growing danger to their lucrative shrine-making business. The source of that threat is the Apostle Paul, and specifically his teaching that gods made by human hands are not real gods, but are rather worthless idols. Paul's point is that if a human being like Demetrius can manipulate and make something with his hands, how can that possibly be a god? How tiny and weak is your god if it's dependent upon you? Back in Acts chapter 17, when speaking to the Athenian philosophers, Paul said, The God who made the world and everything in it is the Lord of heaven and earth and does not live in temples built by human hands. And he is not served by human hands as if he needed anything. Rather, he himself gives everyone life and breath and everything else. As Paul preached that same message in the ancient city of Ephesus, apparently an ever-increasing number of those in the city were convinced of the truth of the reality of what he was saying. You see, God was doing a great work in the city, as we've seen in our previous studies in the last couple of weeks. God was doing a, a mighty and powerful work in the ancient city of Ephesus, resulting in spiritual transformation of more and more people. And as that took place, that gave rise to um, challenge to the cultural practices of the city. As more and more people there were coming to faith in Jesus Christ, they were leaving behind the false worship of the city's resident Greek goddess. In verse 27, Demetrius highlights for his fellow craftsmen three dangers of Paul's rising influence, growing influence in their city. Notice he says, There is danger not only that our trade will lose its good name, but also that the temple of the great goddess Artemis will be discredited, and the goddess herself, who is worshipped throughout the province of Asia and the world, will be robbed of her divine majesty. So Artem, uh, Demetrius rather has this uh, meeting with the guild of silversmiths and related craftsmen who are being adversely affected by the spread of the gospel in the city. And uh, he lays out for them, look, here are the specific dangers that this guy Paul presents to us. The first danger he lists is that their business may become disreputable. And if that happens, then sales of the replica silver shrines they make are going to plummet. And consequently, that is going to affect their bottom line. Their profit is going to be adversely impacted. You see, when the gospel transforms people, it doesn't help the business of those who make silver shrines. The second danger of Paul's gospel preaching, according to Demetrius, is that the actual temple of the great goddess Artemis will be discredited. That is, that it will lose its influence. And I'll talk about that influence in a moment. And the third reason you see there in the text for concern, according to Demetrius, is that Artemis herself would be robbed of her great prestige. In other words, if Paul wasn't stopped, people increasingly would come to ignore both the temple of Artemis and even the goddess herself. And that means that Ephesus would lose its appeal. You see, the temple of Artemis was a great attraction 
to the ancient travelers, as well as to the Ephesians themselves. And pilgrims must have contributed greatly to the prosperity of the city. And therefore, a lot was at stake for these silversmiths and for the population of Ephesus as a whole. And consequently, they were not happy with the rising influence in their city of the way that is the way of the Lord. You know, more often than not, it seems to me that it's true that people don't really care what you personally believe about Jesus Christ as long as you keep it to yourself. Have you found that to be the case? Most people really don't care what you believe about Jesus Christ as long as you keep it to yourself, as long as you practice what we might call a private faith. Your private faith does not challenge them in any, you know, significant way, and so they really don't care. They don't really care if you believe that Jesus is the Son of God. They don't really care if you believe that he was born of a virgin. They're not overly concerned if you believe that Jesus is the Savior of the world. That's fine. People believe all sorts of different things. But when it calls into question their beliefs, and even more so their behavior, that is a different story. Then people get upset. And so, for example, if you believe that God's Word teaches that all human beings are created by God as either only male or female, and that God's plan for marriage is reserved for those of the opposite sex, and that abortion of unwanted babies is the unwarranted ending of human life representing a grave sin against God, then you are seen as a threat and you must be ostracized if not eradicated. You have crossed over from a private faith now and you now have entered into the public sphere. You have entered into the world that we share, and your views and your convictions are dangerous. They are a threat to the idols of the world that we live in. Jared Wilson has said, you will always touch a nerve if you poke someone in the idols. That seems to me to be the case, right? If you want to get a rise from someone, if you want to see someone respond in a negative way towards you, then just start talking about the idols of the world that we live in. That was true in ancient Ephesus. It's also true here in 21st century Toronto. The increasingly predominant mindset in our post-Christian reality is that you can believe whatever you want as long as it doesn't matter, as long as it doesn't have an impact on the pursuits of others. Believe whatever you want, as long as it makes no difference. What do I care? For Demetrius and his fellow silversmiths, the bottom line was that instead of being irrelevant, the preaching of Paul mattered. It mattered a whole lot people were responding to the gospel and their lives were being changed by the grace of the Lord Jesus Christ. And that was having a direct impact on the way that they lived out their life in the midst of that city. And that was affecting people. It wasn't good for business. Their beliefs and the behavior of these followers of Christ, the followers of the way, was a threat to the way of Ephesus. It was a threat to the idols of that culture. The account continues in verse 28 as follows. When they heard this, they were furious. That is, the assembled craftsmen, fellow silversmiths, etc., who were listening to Demetrius that day. And they began shouting, Great is Artemis of the Ephesians. 
Soon the whole city was in an uproar. The people seized uh, Gaius and Aristarchus, Paul's traveling companions from Macedonia, and all of them rushed into the theater together. Paul wanted to appear before the crowd. Of course he did. Whenever there was a crowd, Paul wanted to be there, right? Paul wanted to appear before the crowd, but the disciples would not let him. Can you imagine that? Even some of the officials of the province, friends of Paul, sent him a message begging him not to venture into the theater. At a certain point during this episode, the assembled angry crowd seized two of the ministry colleagues of the apostle, one named Gaius, the other Aristarchus, and they all move into the massive outdoor Roman theater that is still located in ancient Ephesus, the location of ancient Ephesus even today. It was a facility, this is hard to get your head around, it was a facility that would seat 24,000 people. 24,000 people. And these guys drag these ministry associates of Paul, this crowd, this mob that's now in an uproar into the theater. Paul wants to go into the theater and try to reason with the crowd, but some of uh, his fellow believers wisely hold him back. And not only some of the fellow believers, but you'll notice also some of the ruling officials of the city. This tells you how much impact the gospel was having on the ancient city of Ephesus. That there were people even in positions of authority and power within the city that were supporters of Paul and the message of the gospel. And they send a message to Paul, do not go into the theater, you will not come out alive. Beginning in verse 32, we're told, the assembly was in confusion. Some were shouting one thing, some another. Most of the people didn't even know why they were there. <laughs> that happens with a crowd, right? You get a crowd, and then it gets bigger and bigger and bigger, and eventually I, you don't even know why you're, why you're there. You've probably seen this. You've been downtown, and there's some commotion, and a crowd gathers, and you come along, and you're trying to figure out what's happening, what's going on. And people are all upset, but you're there. You're part of the crowd, but you're not really sure why you're there. You're not sure what's going on. Well, that was happening to some degree. The Jews in the crowd, notice the text says, pushed Alexander to the front, and they shouted instructions to him. He motioned for silence in order to make a defense before the people, but when they realized he was a Jew, they all shouted in unison for about two hours, great is Artemis of the Ephesians. Two hours. Probably because they were afraid that the Gentile mob might associate them with the preaching of Paul, seeing that the apostle was also himself a Jew, the Jews in the crowd that day pushed their man named Alexander to the front of the theater. If you know the Roman-style theaters, you have these sloped seats, and then there is kind of a stage area. And so they push Alexander up to the stage area to address the mob that's now in the crowd, in the, uh, in the theater. And probably they wanted to make sure that those present understood that the Jewish community wasn't supporting this guy named Paul because they were afraid they were going to get caught up in what might happen, which would be negative. In other words, there could be some real physical assault and uh, danger here. And so they want to make sure, hey, we're not with this guy, Paul. <laughs> yeah, he's a Jew, but he's not one of us. So just uh, so you know, we're not involved in this. And um, unfortunately, when he started talking and the crowd realized that he himself was a Jew, you know, they weren't really, um, they weren't really able at that point in their mindset to delineate, delineate the distinction. Um, and so they start shouting in unison, great is Artemis of the Ephesians. Great is Artemis of the Ephesians. Great is Artemis of the Ephesians. And they do this for two hours. Great is Artemis of the Ephesians. You know. Probably they went around the stadium for a bit. Great is Artemis of the Ephesians. You know, And they started passing the banners around. You know how you do that? 
great is Artemis of the Ephesians. Reasoning with a mob usually doesn't get you very far, does it? It's hard for us, I think, to appreciate how significant Artemis was to the Ephesians. When you hear this, you think, what's wrong with these people? Right? That's what you think. Two hours, they're shouting, great is Artemis of the Ephesians? Um, I don't get it. Have you ever been to a football game? Have you ever been to a, a soccer match? Uh, it gives you maybe a little bit of a feeling for what can happen when people are excited about something and they're passionate about something. But it's hard for us to really grasp how important Artemis was to the Ephesians. Scholars know some 33 shine, shrines to Artemis in the ancient world, but the single most significant shrine to Artemis was right there in Ephesus. It was the temple of Ephesus. As mentioned in the media clip, that temple, which was located just outside of the city of Ephesians, uh, of, of Ephesus proper, it was four times the size of the Parthenon in Athens. Some of you have been to Athens. Some of you know the famous pictures of the Parthenon up on top of the hill. This temple to, uh, to Artemis was four times the size of that temple. It was the largest building in the ancient Greek world. It had 127 pillars, each standing 60 feet in height. By the way, that's about twice the height of the ceiling of the room that you and I are in right now. Um, the cult of Artemis was one of the most widely practiced in the Greco-Roman world. Every spring, they would have a week-long festival in Ephesus in celebration of Artemis. When people in that day thought of Ephesus, they thought of the god goddess Artemis. Even as when we think of the city of Paris, we think of the Eiffel Tower, or for Rome, we think of the Colosseum. If you were living in that day and you thought uh, the, the, the city of uh, Ephesus was mentioned, you would immediately think of the temple of Artemis. That's the association that would come to your mind first and foremost. Artemis was the major attraction of the city. If you were going to Ephesus, you were going to visit the temple there. You were going to offer to Artemis one of those replica silver shrines. You were going to buy one of the giant foam fingers on sale saying, Artemis is number one. That's what you were doing when you went to Ephesus. Ephesus and the temple of Artemis were synonymous. They were one and the same. You couldn't separate them. And the gospel that Paul was preaching had the potential to ruin it all. That's what Demetrius is saying. You know, Demetrius was smarter than he looked. Demetrius knew the potential of the power of the gospel. And he was concerned. And he had reason to be concerned. What Paul was preaching could ruin the whole thing, the whole gig, the whole deal. It could all crumble because of the message of the gospel. People coming to faith in Jesus Christ and leaving behind the empty idolatry of Artemis to pursue a Jesus-first life was not something that people like Demetrius wanted to have happen. And all of this makes me wonder, as I think about this, if you and I in any way present a challenge to the ever-increasing ungodly features of the culture in which we live. You know, it's interesting to talk about this account from 2,000 years ago and Temple of Artemis and Ephesus and this guy named Demetrius and Paul and it all seems somewhat distant, but let's bring it right into our lives today. Does anyone in your sphere of influence consider your convictions and your commitments as one in Christ a challenge to their beliefs and to their behavior? Now, as I say what I'm going to say here, I want you to please understand I'm not asking you to become obnoxious. Please do not become obnoxious. I'm not asking you to become a know-it-all. Please do not become a know-it-all. I'm not asking you 
to stir the pot just to stir the pot. Please do not do that. We've talked even in the last few weeks about the nature of our witness and how we need to be smart about how we present ourselves and the gospel and the context and learning from Paul. But what I am saying is that if you're living the Christian life, if you're living a Jesus-first life, then guess what? There are going to be people around you who are not going to like that. Um, that's the reality in the day in which we live. Um, probably, if that's not happening, then maybe your light's not shining as bright as it needs to. Maybe you've embraced the, you know, the current approach, which is have a private faith. Just don't bring it into the public. You can believe whatever you want, just keep it to yourself. Maybe that's really what's happening in that case. Shouldn't people that we know, shouldn't people that we relate to, shouldn't they from time to time disagree with what we believe? and how we live our lives? Shouldn't that sometimes trouble them? Shouldn't that sometimes bother them? If we're living a life that is counter to the idolatry of the day in which we live. By our commitment to the gospel, by the values we hold and the priorities we pursue, by our first and final allegiance to Christ as Lord of our lives, do we present any challenge at all to the idolatry of our culture? If not, then I would suggest something's not right. Something is not as it should be. The gospel we hold to, if that is the case, is at worst a false gospel, and at best it's incomplete. I say that because following Jesus is supposed to impact everything about us, not just our private experience of spirituality. No one cares about your private experience of spirituality. Nobody cares about that. It's when you go public that people get exercised. Jesus Christ came to impact every aspect of our lives, not just our private spiritual experience. In other words, Jesus didn't only save you so that you would know the great value of beginning every day meditating on his word and practicing prayer. He didn't only save you so that you would know the assurance of his presence with you in the darkest valleys of your life experience. Likewise, Jesus didn't save you to only change the way you spend your Sunday mornings. No. Jesus saved you to change everything about you so that your life comes to reflect his life. And when that happens, well, how did they treat him? Not always very well. And so what I'm saying is, don't go out and become a martyr. Don't say, well, the pastor wants me to go and offend as many people as I can this week with my Christian faith, and then I'll feel good about myself because people won't like me. No, 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 that's not what I'm saying at all. But I'm saying when your life in Christ moves from private spirituality to the public marketplace, some people are going to have a problem with it. Your values, your priorities, your pursuits, they're not going to share those. And increasingly so in the day in which we live. When people properly understood the gospel being the fact that Jesus is saving you and me in order to change everything about us, our priorities, passions, and pursuits, our approach to money, relationships, and politics, how we respond to success, failure, and hardship, how we exercise authority, influence, and privilege, and even the way that we deal with those that hurt us, oppose us, and reject us, then guess what? You are going to get a response from time to time. 
And if you get no response, something isn't right. Because the world in which we live in is moving further and further away from the things of God. And if your life is moving closer and closer to the way of Christ, well, you do the math. When we begin to more fully live out such a Jesus-first life, the people around us and the broader culture we're part of will take note because our faith moves from simply being that private experience to something that the Lord uses to make a public impact. Let me put it another way. If everyone believed like you and lived like you, would any of the idol makers in our culture go out of business? If everyone believed like you and lived like you do right now, would any of the idol makers in our culture go out of business? Or, if truth be known, are we actually helping to keep certain forms of idolatry in business? Instead of resisting the idols of our culture, have we embraced them to one degree or another so that they have become our idols as well? Now, talking about idolatry to a 21st century audience is like, what? I, 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 I don't believe in idols. What are you talking about? So we need to dig just a bit deeper here. Because idolatry is very prominent in our day. And can I say to you as a brother or sister in Christ that we struggle with this. It's part of of being in the world but not being of the world and that is a hard thing to pull off isn't it and so idolatry becomes a part of our experience now i think it's probably true i think i'm safe to say there's no one here today and no one watching online that's worshiping the greek goddess artemis by offering to her silver shrines but those of us in Christ are not immune to the challenge of idolatry, for anything that we want more than God effectively becomes an idol to us. As Christian author Richard Keyes has written, quote, idolatry may well come in the form of an overattachment to something that is in itself perfectly good. An idol can be a physical object, a property, a person, an activity, an institution, a hope, an image, an idea, a pleasure, a hero, anything that can substitute for God. Here is a good barometer to use. What do you think about most in life? Anything you think about more than God you need to think about that possibly having become an idol. What is uppermost in your mind? Let's even make it easier. Let's say you're just relaxing. You're not at work. You're not at school. You're just relaxing. What is more prominent in your thinking than anything else? In this regard, the Apostle Paul writes in Colossians chapter 3, verse 5. What a great verse this is. Don't be greedy. Now notice this. For a greedy person is a what? Is an idolater. Worshipping the things of this world. Well, that's fascinating to me. A greedy person, Paul says, is an idolater. A worshipper of idols. How does that work? In other words, your idol is whatever you're greedy for. Money, approval, sex, power, popularity, success, a relationship, a product, an experience, comfort, choice, influence. Now, none of those things are wrong in and of themselves, and there's nothing wrong in liking those things, but greed is more than liking something. It is a deep desire to possess something. And what we desire for in that way, we worship. That's what Paul's saying. 
Idolatry is what happens to us when we allow anything other than God himself to be that which we most desire. In Matthew chapter 6, verse 21, our Lord said, Where your treasure is, there your heart will also be. You see, whatever you treasure most in life is the thing that has control over your heart. If we treasure God most, then God has captured our hearts. But if we treasure anything else more than God, that thing has taken our hearts captive, and that thing is an idol for us. So now, when you think about idolatry, stop thinking about those little silver shrines that Demetrius made. And start thinking about so much in our life that can become idols to us because they've displaced the Lord Jesus Christ as the focus of our heart's desire. And can I say this? I was going to say this in a few weeks, but I'll just say it now and we'll talk more about it in a few weeks. That's exactly what happens to the church in Ephesus. If you know in Revelation the problem that's highlighted with the church of Ephesus is that they have left their first love. They've allowed other things to become their first love. The idols of their lives. The trouble is not desire itself. I want you to make sure you understand that. It's not the issue of desire. Having desires is part of how God has made us as human beings, and we thank God for that. It's not usually the thing that we want that is the problem, but that we want it more than we want God. For instance, there is nothing wrong with wanting to have a family, to be successful at work, to live a healthy life. However, if my failure to experience any of these things leads me to be bitter and dissatisfied, then they have become more important to me than worshiping the Lord as the leader of my life. In that sense, idolatry is a disordered desire. It's a disordered desire. It's craving, wanting, being satisfied by anything or anyone more than God himself. That's what an idol is. Tim Chester has written, quote, A good thing can become a God thing if it eclipses God, if the gift matters more to us than the giver. A good thing can become a God thing. It can become an idol. It's not that idols are all in and of themselves wrong in the sense that the desire for those things is wrong. It's that they have become the focus of our life. They have become the thing that we are most passionate about, the thing that we crave more than anything else. That's what an idol is. And I ask you, do we struggle with that? Of course we do. Of course we do. In the world in which we live, with the contemporary cultural idols of our time, we who are called to live as those in Christ, we struggle with this, don't we? We wrestle with this. And if we're not wrestling with it, then we should. How often do we fix our hearts on the pursuit of a good thing to the neglect of pursuing the best thing, which is Jesus himself? We must remember that Jesus isn't the way to the good life as we so often define it, power, pleasure, possessions, prestige. No, Jesus himself is the good life. He's not the way to it. He is the good life. Knowing, serving, and glorifying him is that which we should most desire. The best God has to offer us isn't the good things he so graciously gives us, it is himself. We know God through Jesus Christ. 
And that is the best. There is no better. And yet, at times, we want to displace that reality with the things around us that God has graciously given us, and we allow those things to take ascendancy in our lives, and they become what's most important to us. And so I wondered this morning if there are any idols that need to be toppled from the throne of your life. Has Jesus been displaced from the throne at the center of the temple of your life? What's sitting on the throne in your life? It may be a good thing, but it's not the best thing if it's not Jesus. And that good thing becomes an idol of our worship. Is there anything in your life that means more to you than Jesus? Asking that question is troubling to me. Because on any given day, I think if I was honest, I would have to list some things. Is anything in your life more important to you than Jesus? Jesus once said, no one can serve two masters. For you will hate one and love the other, or be devoted to one and despise the other. As those in Christ, we cannot love anyone or anything more than we love him and still be devoted to him. We each have to choose, and it is a choice that we each have to make every day, including this day. Heavenly Father, We thank you for the privilege that we have this morning to study your word, to consider again the truth that you have revealed to us, to allow that truth to resonate in our lives as the Spirit of God takes the truth of your word and applies it to our lives in a very practical and meaningful way. This morning we've talked about the idolatry of Artemis in ancient Ephesus, but really we've talked about the idolatry that may be an experience in our lives here in 21st century Toronto. And we've also talked about how our lives need to be more than just about a private spirituality. There needs to be a public aspect to who we are. And that at times is going to be rejected. And that at times is going to mean that we're going to receive pushback. I pray, Lord, that uh, while we don't look for that in the sense of wanting to disturb or disrupt or, Lord, intentionally kind of stir the pot in that sense, but as we seek to live our life for you, as we fix our gaze on the North Star of Jesus Christ. As those moments come when people reject our values and our priorities and our beliefs and our behavior, I pray, Lord, that if that is reflective of you, that, Lord, that that you might even in the midst of that context that you might work your grace in their lives and might use that exchange, that moment, that discussion to further your work of grace in their lives. Help us, Lord, to have the confidence that is ours in knowing you and in knowing the gospel. Not an arrogance, but a confidence, for you are the Lord God. And there is nothing that anyone will say or do that would displace you from your lordship. And so I pray, Lord, that you will help us in the midst of the world in which we live that's increasingly pursuing idols that are counter, a counter, Lord, to your desire for us. What you have that is best for us. 
as our world moves further and further away from those things, I pray that you will give us the courage, give us the wisdom to live lives that honor you and glorify you. And that begins with us individually, making sure that there are no idols in our lives that have displaced our first love for you. We pray this in Jesus' name.